All right, welcome everybody. And thank you for attending the Friends of the Cabildo member lecture series. I'm gonna get started just a couple seconds early just to give you guys an update on what we have upcoming for our tours. I mean, for our, uh, for our lecture series, although our tours are back and started uh, last Friday. So uh, we do have daily tours again at 10.30 and 1.30. Um, and then we even have some neighborhood tours coming up. Uh, I know we have a Marini part two. We have um, a bunch of lower garden district tours upcoming. Um, and I hope that you'll, you'll probably see um, on TV and in the newspaper related to the 50th anniversary of the New Orleans Architecture Series, the Friends of the Cabildo's first book on the lower garden district its anniversary is this year and we're going to do some programming around that in uh, early November and we're going to do some lectures around it as well. But just to give you an update on October, um, after tonight's lecture, we have uh, next uh, Tuesday, we have Chris King doing the blues, the authentic, the authentic narrative of my music and culture book. We have Judy Cooper doing, uh, which is a historic New Orleans collections production, Dancing in the Streets, Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs of New Orleans. And then we have Rosa Hawkins, who was a member of the Dixie Cups, along with Steve Bergsman doing the Chapel of Love, the story of the New Orleans girl group, the Dixie Cups. And um, just to mention that New Orleans Architecture Series Lower Garden District book at 50 years, that'll be November 2nd. Um, so I hope you can attend some of those lectures. As always, as a member of the Friends of the Cabildo, you attend for free. Uh, if you're not, you can uh, purchase a ticket for just $10. Membership start is as low as forty dollars, so it's a great. We're going to be these are these aren't going anywhere. These these weekly member lecture series. Um, so I think we've probably done this year about twenty to twenty five, and we'll probably end the year with about thirty five. So uh, we are we've already booked into almost February of twenty twenty two. So they're not going anywhere. So I hope you will take advantage of that. Um, let me share. No, I'm gonna hold off on sharing the screen. I can handle that, Alan, but in a second. So tonight, our speaker uh, attained his, his, his uh, bachelor in history from Yale College before entering, uh, earning a, J, uh, a JD from Harvard Law School and has practiced law in Boston for 40 years. An avid reader of early American history, he discovered Lafayette in 2002 and spent two years translating Auguste, Auguste uh, Lavasseur's so how, how, how bad is that? Not bad? Okay, Lafayette in America in 1824 and 1825, the first hand account of uh, Lafayette's farewell tour of America written by his private secretary. Uh, our speaker's translation was published in 2006. It's currently in its third printing. Um, and I will put a link so you can purchase it uh, as a discount from the 1850 house. Um, and you can put your chat questions in here as well. Uh, and we'll get um, Alan to answer them in a bit. Uh, so his, pub his translation was published in 2006 in his third printing and it discussed in, and has discussed in each of the 24 states that Lafayette visited during the farewell tour. So please welcome Alan Hoffman. Thank you, Jason. Are we, uh, you can hear me? I can hear you, yep. Oh, great, so we're good. So in, in this talk, um, I'm gonna give you a kind of an overview of the farewell tour. And then we're gonna turn and spend a lot of time on the visit to New Orleans. And uh, one thing I can say about the visit was it was both extraordinary in many ways, but also typical of a visit by Lafayette to a big city in 1824 and 18. 25. And when we get to New Orleans, I'm going to be spending a lot of time uh, really reading from primary sources, uh, either newspaper accounts or uh, Levasseur's book. But let's go back to the beginning. Uh, in 1846, Ensigns and Thayer of New York published a covered broadside titled The Pictorial History of the United States. That would be the first slide, uh, Jason. In addition... You. Sure. Reading right now, yep. In addition to depicting the seals of each of the states and printed information about the discovery of America, the battles of the revolution and the war of 1812 and population statistics and a list of distinguished men, this print contains images of three figures below the title. And let's wait until we can get the slide up so you can see it. 
Oh, there it is. Um, and you look at those three images and you see Washington in the middle. Uh, to our right is uh, Benjamin Franklin. And to our left and Washington's right is General Lafayette. So the question is, how come Lafayette? Why not Jefferson or Madison or Adams or Hamilton or even Jackson? But no, a Frenchman, Lafayette. And why was that? And we'll try to answer that today. In the 19th century and into the 20th century, Lafayette's reputation in America was extraordinary. He was already popular before his arrival in 1824 when he came as the last surviving major general of the Continental Army. He was popular by virtue of his important role in the revolution, his subsequent activities on behalf of American interests, his close friendship with Washington and his storybook life. However, this trip during which he toured each of the 24 states and was treated as a conquering hero uh, reaffirmed his reputation and elevated him into iconic status. The only analogies that I could think of is the excitement that was caused during the Beatles tour in the 1960s among teenagers, and also the excitement caused by John Paul II's visit in 1979. The result was that Lafayette's name was firmly imprinted on the American psyche. When state banks printed legal tender in the 1830s and 40s, Lafayette's face appeared on bills in more states than any other person except for Washington. You see two of those bills uh, on the screen now. Scores of counties, cities, towns, and townships, actually 80 in total, were named Lafayette, Fayette, Fayetteville, Lafayetteville, or LaGrange. Now LaGrange, the next slide, is the name of the chateau that Lafayette lived in from 1799 to 1834. So the next slide would be the image of LaGrange. There it is. There is even one LaGrangeville. There are countless streets, squares, and parks. There are eight streets named for Lafayette in the city of Boston and 10 in the five boroughs of New York City. Numerous statues and monuments were built. Daniel Chester French's Lafayette Monument stands in Prospect Park, Brooklyn. That's the next slide. Uh, after France gave Lafayette the Statue of Liberty, America, that's the uh, monument in Prospect Park. Daniel Chester French, of course, later did the Lincoln Memorial. But uh, after France gave America the Statue of Liberty, America reciprocated. This statue, an equestrian statue by Paul Whelan Bartlett, was given to France in 1908. It was called the Children's Statue because the fundraising was done by hundreds of thousands of American school children. It stood outside the Louvre until the IM Pay period, Pyramid was constructed, and it was then moved to this spot on the, uh, uh, on the right bank of the Seine. A copy of this sits outside the State House in Hartford, Connecticut. Mount Lafayette was named by the people of Franconia, New Hampshire in 1824. Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania took its name in 1826. There's a Lake Lafayette in Northern Florida and a Lafayette River in Southern Virginia. Well, in, in early 1824, Lafayette decided to return one last time to the United States after he received President James Monroe's invitation in 1824. In July, he departed for America with his son, whose name was George Washington Lafayette, you can guess who he was named for, with his, with his private secretary, Auguste Levasseur, who kept a journal of the trip and a valet aboard the Cadmus, an American packet ship. This trip, the farewell tour, was a unique event in our history, if not the history of the world. You may think that what I just said is hyperbole, but surely I am not alone in expressing this opinion. In 1830, Everett Everett of Boston wrote a review of Lafayette in America in 1824, which had come out in, in 1824 and 1825, which had come out in 1829, in the North American Review. In the review, he praised the book, he praised Lafayette and, he, and, and the farewell tour. About the tour, he wrote, and I quote, an event taken in all its parts, unparalleled in the history of man. Here is this 67 year old man, tall but somewhat portly, who walks with a limp and a cane and wears a hairpiece, 
who has we not who has wielded no military power or political authority since 1792, who then held no public position, and he's treated like a conquering hero, a Caesar or an Alexander, for 13 months in every corner of a vast country. There are parades, militia reviews, dinners, banquets, balls, meet and greets with school children, the public, and members of private societies. Triumphal arches are constructed in cities large and small, welcoming Lafayette. All of these things happen, by the way, in New Orleans, and we'll get to that. Americans of all races, each gender, and of every age wanted to touch this man who had done so much for their country. A whole cottage industry of consumer goods was created. Lafayette prints, fans, hats, buttons, bandanas, medallions, sheet music, bottles, brushes, baby shoes, ribbons, scarves, sapphire, and other ceramics, including a set of dishes depicting Lafayette's arrival in New York City, and ladies' kid gloves with his face imprinted on them. That, that's the slide that you, you're currently look at, looking at, two examples of those gloves. They were also worn by men. Numerous American painters wanted to, and many did, paint Lafayette from life. The two most famous ones are this one from Samuel F. B. Morse, who later invented the telegraph, but he was a fine painter. And the next one by Thomas Sully of Philadelphia, and that would be the next slide. Uh, Jason. On August 15th, 18, there it is. On August 15th, 1824, the Cadmus arrived in New York Bay. Now the next slide is an 1822 painting of that ship, Lafayette's ship. As Levasseur contemplated Staten Island to his left, quote, the noise of a cannon caught my attention from another side. It was the artillery of Fort Lafayette, which was announcing the arrival of the Cadmus to the city of New York. The next slide is a 19th century painting, and it's of the Narrows between Upper New York Bay and Lower New York Bay, and it's on the Brooklyn side, and that uh, structure is Fort Lafayette. Because it was a Sunday, Lafayette disembarked from Staten Island and stayed at the home of Vice President Daniel Tompkins. On the following day, he arrived at Castle Garden at the southern tip of Manhattan in the Battery on a steamship called the Chancellor Livingston. And he was accompanied by a small flotilla, of, by a numerous flotilla of boats, and was welcomed by all the military and civilian dignitaries of the city, and according to Levasseur, a crowd of 200,000. That uh, is one of the ceramics that uh, was created around his visit. It shows the arrival of Lafayette at Castle Garden. Having been feted in New York City, Lafayette headed for Boston on August 20th, 1824, on the Old Post Road. He arrived in Roxbury, a near suburb, a little after midnight on the 24th, having stopped in many cities and towns in Connecticut and in Providence, Rhode Island. On the morning of the 24th, he headed to Boston from the Shirley Eustace House, which was the governor's mansion in Roxbury, in a procession of 70,000. Lafayette crossed the Boston Common to the State House, where he was addressed by the governor in reply. In the afternoon, there was a dinner at the Exchange Tavern. According to the local press, he visited John Hancock's widow at her home in the evening. This visit is memorialized in Louisa May Alcott's book, An Old Fashioned Girl. While this is a woke work of fiction, the story has the ring of truth to it, and its veracity is supported by the familiar relationship between Alcott's mother, Abby May Alcott, and Madam Hancock. They were both related to Mayor Josiah Quincy, who was shepherding Lafayette around and shepherded him to uh, Madam Hancock's house. In this story, a grandmother describes Lafayette's visit to her grandchildren and, a, and their friend. Well, by and by the general, escorted by the mayor, drove up. Dear me, I see him now, a little old man in nankeen trouser, trousers and vest, a long blue coat and ruffled shirt, leaning on his cane, for he was lame, and smiling and bowing like a true Frenchman. As he approached, the three old ladies rose and curtsied with the utmost dignity. Lafayette bowed first to the governor's picture, then to the governor's widow and kissed her hand. That was droll, for on the back of her glove was stamped Lafayette's likeness and the gallant old man kissed his own face. Then some of the young ladies were presented and as if to, uh, to escape any further self-salutation, the Marquis kissed the pretty girls on the cheek. Yes, my dears, 
Here is just the spot where the dear old man saluted me. I'm quite as proud of it now as I was then, for he was a brave, good man, and he helped us in our troubles. The next slide, which you see, is a glove that was around Au Courant in uh, Boston in 1824. While in Boston, Lafayette visited Harvard College, where Edward Everett addressed him, and his son, George, received an honorary degree. Lafayette had already received one in the 1780s. On the 29th, he visited John Adams, old John Adams in Quincy. On the 31st, he headed north, stopping in Chelsea, Lynn, Marblehead, Salem, Beverly, Ipswich, and Newburyport. He had events in every place, and it all took place in the rain. Citizens of New Hampshire joined the frenzy surrounding Lafayette's visit on September 1, 1824 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Although Lafayette proved to be a magnet uh, to all Americans, veterans of the American Revolution more than all the others flocked to greet him. September 1 was the day of Franklin Pierce's graduation from Bowdoin College. As Peter Walner writes in his biography of New Hampshire's only president, Franklin had been selected to give an honorary oration in Latin and wrote his father, General Benjamin Pierce, hoping he would attend the ceremony. Walner writes, in this he was disappointed, however, as the old general joined other Revolutionary War soldiers at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to honor General Lafayette, who was then on his famous tour of the United States. So General Pierce dissed his son's college graduation and his val valedictory address to get some face time with Lafayette. After visiting Portsmouth and returning to Boston, Lafayette headed west to Lexington, Concord, and Worcester, on his return to New York City for the second visit there. In Lexington, this banner was hung on an evergreen at the entrance to Lexington Green. Welcome, friend of America, to the birthplace of American liberty. You can't tell from this uh, image, but it's 39 feet long, nine inches high. It's green paint on cloth, and it's pretty well preserved, and it's, uh, it's owned by the Lexington uh, Historical Society. On September 4th, September 14th, the city of New York gave Lafayette a grand fete at Castle Garden, the same place where he had arrived. That's a current image of Castle Garden. It still exists. It's now the ticket office for the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. And that event set the standard for the for farewell tour events in other cities. Lafayette left New York in late September, 1824, headed west through New Jersey to Philadelphia before heading southward. He arrived in, at Yorktown in time to celebrate Surrender Day on October 19th. He reached Monticello on November 4th, spent 10 days with Jefferson, and then a few days with Madison at Montpelier. He spent much of the winter of 1824 in Washington City, making a number of side trips to Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Although his original intent was to visit only the initial 13 states, by this time he had received invitations from all the other states, and he decided to accept them. Thus, he left Washington on February 23rd, 1825 for his Southern and Western campaigns. After stopping in places in Virginia and North Carolina, he entered South Carolina. In Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, an incident occurred that encapsulates this man who made no distinctions of race, color, or creed. In many of the Southern states, local officials had decreed that slaves, as well as African-American freedmen, should be kept away from all the public ceremonies, including parades and uh, military reviews that were being held in honor of Lafayette. The authorities in Columbia did so as well. This was because of Lafayette's reputation as an abolitionist. In an autobiographical sketch of Dr. Maurice uh, Moore, who was a militiaman when Lafayette visited Columbia, Columbia on March 11, 1825, the following incident is reported. So this occurs at a private reception after a parade and a militia review. And uh, Dr. Moore writes, two sentinels with fixed bayonets on their guns were posted at the door to prevent the entrance of intruders. Here I saw a strange but pleasant incident transpire. An old African, neatly dressed, came to the front door and started in but the sentinels interposed their bayoneted guns to bar his entrance. The old man contemptuously pushed them away aside saying, Shaw, Shaw, see guns afore you was born. Been where they been shot by soldiers too. 
and without further opposition from anyone, gained his way. He came straight to the room where the distinguished guest was standing among the crowd and said, I come to see General Lafayette. Lafayette turned, looked at him and remarked, an old acquaintance, don't tell me who it is. The Negro advanced to the marquee and bowing, held out his hand and said, howdy, Master Lafayette, you remember me? Yes, stop, don't tell me your name. Ah, I have it, Pompey, belonging to Colonel Buchanan, the first servant who waited on me when I came to America. When I landed at Georgetown, I was taken first to the camp of General Buchanan, near there, and Pompey waited on me, said he, and he, as he shook warmly the old man's hand, the nobleman called for a glass of champagne with Pompey, which that worthy took with great dignity. Then he put out his hand and said, goodbye, Mass Lafayette, we get no, we'll never meet again, God bless you. They shook hands again, Pompey went out, mounted his pony and started for his home near Winsboro, saying he'd come to see General Lafayette, now he'd done that, he was going home. When Lafayette responded positively to the governor's invitation to visit Louisiana and indicated he would be visiting New Orleans, a committee of five city councilors and four legislatures was appointed to plan for his reception. After considerable discussion, the committee decided that Lafayette should be housed at the Cabildo, the old Cabildo, which was then serving as city hall. Thus, the city officials were evicted and the building was transformed for the occasion. According to a local source, a richly appointed parlor took the place of the city council. The powder magazine became a fine dining room and the mayor's offices, the secretary's office, the office of the treasury proper were converted into suitable rooms. Everywhere the ceilings were embellished with cornices and rosework. Modern fireplaces of marble replaced woodwork of inferior quality. Tints of rich and good quality decorated the walls. As for the furniture, there was gathered up all that could be offered of that kind by a city where such rich objects of luxury were almost unknown a few years before. Elegant tints and draperies, bright, brilliant chandeliers, heavy mirrors, novelty rugs, nothing in fact was spared to furnish properly what was already becoming known as, quote, the House of Lafayette. The Place d'Armes, which is the uh, image that you have in front of you from the period, uh, now Jackson Square, which Lafayette would cross before arriving at the Cabildo, was decorated with an elaborate triumphal arch. Levasseur in his journal describes the arch this way. The monument, 68 feet high, 40 feet of which were below the crown of the arch and a total of 58 feet wide, 20 feet of which consisted of an open arcade and 25 feet deep rested on a footing simulating Cerevesa marble. The base forming a pedestal in green Italian marble was adorned with colossal statues of justice and liberty. The allegorical base supported an arcade of the Doric order accompanied by four coupled columns on each face. The curves of this arch were composed of 24 stones each decorated with, each decorated with a star of gilded bronze joined together by a projecting stone on which the word constitution was engraved. Representing in this manner the 24 states of the union joined by a single uh, bond. On the pediment simulating yellow Veronese marble uh, were displayed two figures of fame blowing a trumpet held in one hand and holding in the other a laurel with banners bearing on one side the name of Washington and on the other the name of Lafayette. The national eagle in relief surrounded the whole. The upper pedestal supported a vertical section of seven feet on which it was written on one side in English and the other in French, quote, a grateful Republic dedicated this monument to Lafayette. At the top of the monument was constructed a group representing wisdom, resting her hand on the bust of the immortal Franklin. And the four corners were adorned with lavish national trophies decorated with bundles of wood and standards. The names of the members of Congress who signed the Declaration of Independence and those of the officers who distinguished themselves during the Revolutionary War, decorated different parts of the Triumphal Arch. The beautiful work designed by Mr. Pillier and constructed by Mr. Fogliardi offered a remarkable totality and the reliefs were of the most beautiful effect. The remaining preparations for the Committee of Arrangements included the by now customary parade into the city, numerous addresses of welcome, illuminations, theater plays, a ball, 
a Masonic banquet and a Masonic banquet in honor of Brother Lafayette. At 2 p.m. on Sunday, April 25, Lafayette arrived at the levee near the New Orleans battleground aboard the Natchez, which had transported Lafayette and his party from Mobile to uh, New Orleans. Livasor describes the arrival at New Orleans this way. We docked near the famous lines where 12,000 elite English troops were crushed by several hundred men. Half of them were carrying arms for the first time. To the shouts of vive la liberté, vive la mi de l'Amérique, vive Lafayette, which astonished us by being spoken in French, we went up on the deck. How astonished we were to see the riverbank covered with French uniforms. For a moment, we believed ourselves transported to the bosom of our fatherland, liberated again, and our hearts beat with joy. General Lafayette disembarked to the sound of artillery and to the cheering of a considerable throng who despite the inclement weather, it was raining again of the day and the distance from the city filled the embankment. He was received by a large escort of cavalry and by 12 marshals who had been named to lead the procession. Leaning on the arm of his former companion in arms, Mr. Mr. Duplantier, and on that of General Villaray, he proceeded to Montgomery House, which served as headquarters to Jackson on the day on which he covered himself with glory by his noble defense of the lines. The governor of the state, Henry Johnson, was waiting for him there, and he greeted the general by speaking to him in the name of the people of Louisiana. In his reply, Lafayette said, when I found myself on your magnificent river within the limits of this commonwealth, by which I have so honorably and affectionately uh, been invited, the emotions of American and French patriotism have united in my heart as they have mingled in the blessed union which has made Louisiana a part of that Republican Confederacy that has risen for the happiness of existing millions of numerous millions yet to come and for the example of mankind. After Lafayette had spent some time mingling with the large crowd that had gathered, a procession was formed that headed towards the city. The streets on the route to the Place d'Armes were filled with inhabitants who were straining to get a glimpse of Lafayette as his carriage passed. When Lafayette left his carriage and entered the first gate of the public square, the bells began to ring and a crowd of 10,000 united in, in saluting the general. The mayor, Louis Philippe de Raffignac, addressed the nation's guest under, this, under the magnificent triumphal arch. Everything, general, must be a source of emotions for you. In the too short stay that you propose to make here, you will notice doubtless the effects produced by our wise institutions. They are the results of that glorious independence for which you fought and of that exalted constitution in the establishment of which you cooperated. Thus, let us join our thanks to that which the American people address to you. They are heard from Maine to the banks of the Sabine River and will be the consolation and the glory of your life. After Lafayette's response, he proceeded in the company of the mayor, the governor, and Father Antonio de Sella under the triumphal arch to Government House. The next slide is uh, Government House, where the city council, having been evicted from the Cabildo, was meeting. Following another welcoming speech by the city's recorder, Dennis Prieur, and Lafayette's ever gracious reply, the general departed to the Cabaldo. The Cabildo. When he reached the door of the building, which is the next slide, the rapture of the multitude, multitude burst out in long and reiterated acclamations. The roar of the artillery, the deep and religious sound of church bells, the heartfelt homage of thousands of freemen exposed to torrents of rain, the associations of ideas produced by the recollection of past events in which the hero now honored bore a signal part inspired every reflecting mind with sensations so new, various and profound that they never can be effaced from the memory of those who felt them. The general waved his hands to the people and ascended to his apartments where he found the solicitude of his friends had provided everything, whatever, that could administer to the comfort of their guests. Well, he wasn't allowed to rest for long. Shortly thereafter, he was ushered to the balcony of the Cabildo to review the troops who were to pass before him. 
The assembled multitude cheered, a band of music played the Marseillaise, 90 Choctaw warriors joined the throng which stood before the general. After personally greeting many of the people who had come to see him, Lafayette was allowed to enter the house and dine with the governor, the mayor, the reporter, and members of the city corporation and the committee of arrangements. Finally, after the dinner, which included patriotic songs and toasts, the general entered his private apartments for the night. On Monday, April 11th, another rainy day, Lafayette welcomed to the Cabildo members of the Louisiana House of Representatives and its speaker, Andre Roman, who addressed him. He spent a good part of the day with ordinary citizens who came to see him. Later, he paid visitors visits to the governor, the mayor, and the wife of Florida's representative to Congress who was in town. After several more visits, he returned to the Cabildo for dinner. At eight o'clock, Lafayette went to Mr. Crawford's theater where he was acclaimed by the patrons. After some time, he bowed to the audience and repaired to John Davis's Orleans, Orleans Theater. Quote, the house had never been so crowded. And when the general appeared in the superbly ornamented box prepared for him, the enthusiasm of the audience knew no bounds. Loud bursts of applause shook the edifice. And when the noise seemed to cease, it would again revive with increased force, like the flames bursting out in sun, in, in sun flash from the embers of an apparently subdued con conflagration. On Tuesday, April 12, the sun rose bright and brought a cascade of ladies accompanied by their male relatives to meet Lafayette. At 11, a delegation of the legal community, the bar came to visit and Pierre d'Herbigny addressed the general on their behalf. Of course, Lafayette replied. This visit was followed by a delegation of Spaniards, citizens and refugees, whose spokesman, Mr. Campy, expressed their gratitude to Lafayette, who had campaigned unsuccessfully in the French Chamber of Deputies against France's sending its troops to Spain to support the Bourbon monarchy against the Republican forces led by Rafael del Rego. Lafayette replied with customary grace. He spent the rest of the day at home conversing with ordinary citizens, including several fellow veterans of the American Revolution. Tuesday, having been selected as the night of the obligatory ball, the ladies withdrew from the Cabildo earlier than on the day before. A splendid illumination lit up the sky in front of the Orleans Theater, the site of the ball. In the theater, the pit had been raised to the level of the stage to form a large dance floor. At 10 p.m., the company had arrived, but dancing was languid as the principal objective of the evening was to honor and welcome Lafayette. When he arrived, accompanied by the governor, the mayor, and the committee of arrangements, dancing ceased altogether and the noise was not less than the night before. After a short time, Lafayette was escorted, escorted to two large rooms combined into one for a supper and seated where he could see 600 ladies who sat at the tables. The governor's toast to Lafayette was, Lafayette, in him unite the remembrance of the past glory, the enjoyment of present happiness, and the brightness, the brightest hope of futurity. After supper, the general retired, but the amusements continued until near morning. On Wednesday, April 13, the number of visit, visitors to Lafayette's headquarters in the Cabildo was even greater than on the previous days. They included Rev Revolutionary War veterans who had arrived from neighboring states. After the public had left at 3 p.m., Lafayette had private interviews with several invited guests and paid a call on the two federal senators, Dominique Bouligny and Josiah S. Johnston. The Bishop Louis Dubourg came to offer his greetings to Lafayette. He was followed by Father Antonio de Sedella. Levasseur describes Father Antonio this way, and that image is a, an image of him. It's a large painting, and I understand that it's at the Cabildo um, as we speak. Father Antonio, that is how they call him, is a venerable Spanish capuchin of the Order of St. Francis, who has lived in Louisiana for many years. Animated by an ardent and sincere piety, Father Antonio play, prays silently for all the world without requesting prayers of anyone. Situated in the midst of a population of different sects, he does not believe himself obliged to disturb others' conscience, consciences by seeking to recruit in the name of God. Sometimes, like a capuchin, Father Antonio 
begs, but it is always when he has a good deed to do and when his feeble income, exhausted by his constant charity, does not permit him to do it himself. Every year when on the return of autumn, yellow fever, when the yellow fever spreading its deadly hand on New Orleans causes the frightened wealthy to flee into their resplendent country estates to seek refuge against disease and death, then Father Antonio's virtue was displayed in all of its brilliance, in all of its strength. In these days of terror and of bereavement, how many unfortunates abandoned by their friends, even by their parents, have owed their health and their life to his dedication, his caring, and his piety. Of all those whom he has saved, and there are very many of them, there is not a single one who could say, quote, before bestowing his attentions on me, he asked what religion I belong to. Liberty and charity, that is the entire morality of Father Antonio, and so he is not liked by the bishop. Levasseur was a bit anti-clerical. <clears throat> Levasseur continues, when he came to see the general, he was clad according to the dress of his order in a long brown robe clasped on his waist by a coarse rope. When he saw the general, he threw his arms, threw himself into his arms while shouting, oh, my son, I have found grace before the Lord since he has allowed me to see and hear the most worthy apostle of liberty before my death. He then conversed with him for some time with the most tender affection, complimenting him on the glorious and well-merited reception that the Americans were giving him and withdrew modestly into a corner of the room far from the crowd. The general and his party dined at the Cabildo on that evening. His guests included the governor and several veterans of the revolution. In the evening, pursuant to previous arrangements, the citizens began to illuminate their houses. Uh, their houses. At eight o'clock, the public square presented a spectacle truly splendid and magnificent. Streaks of fire marked the bold outlines of the majestic triumphal arc elevated in the middle of the square. Transparent globes of various colors floated as if self-supported and lighted the vault under which the general had passed. While illuminated pyramids placed at the four corners of the structure poured over every part of it a flood of light which showed conspicuously all the emblematic figures and the various inscriptions by which it is adorned. The house of the general looked as if it stood in the midst of a conflagration. The corresponding building next to the church was illuminated with equal splendor. Wreaths of lamps of all colors hung gracefully suspended to the trees of the square, connecting them together by garlands of fire. The, the effect of the illumination seen through the verdure of their newly sprung foliage was inexpressibly beautiful. The spectacle under the trees viewed from the balconies was no less pleasing. The ladies' heads ornamented with flowers and plumes of various and brilliant hues presented the appearance of a garden of flowery shrubs agitated by the breeze. The iron railing which surrounds the square appeared like a wall of fire. Torrents of light poured on every side and spread with such splendor on this spot that the city, though well illuminated, appeared comparatively dim. The multitude collected in the square and adjoining streets exceeded what was thought possible in a population of 50,000 souls. A crowd of ladies dressed as for a ball, filled the square, covered the benches prepared for them and the wide space in front of the general's house. The roar of artillery and the thundering acclamations of the multitude announced the arrival of the general. His Landau made its way slowly through the crowd, which fell back to make room for it. The people precipitated themselves into his house and filled the gallery. The general appeared on the balcony, saluted the spectators and testified by his expressive looks and gestures, the emotions which their love excited in his breast. For half an hour, the acclamations of the people resounded through the square and accompanied the beloved and revered patriot to the two theaters and the ballroom in St. Philip Street, at each of which he was received with, with an enthusiasm felt with undiminished rapture wherever he, he appears, but indescribable to those who have not themselves experienced it. That was Wednesday. Thursday, April 14th was known to be Lafayette's last full day. All those residents who had not yet come to see him eagerly flocked to his headquarters to have that privilege. Their visitation, however, was delayed 
as Lafayette had still another interview with Father Antonio. According to Levasseur, he pleaded with Lafayette to help Spain. Perhaps the Lord will reserve you yet for the liberation of other nations. So my son, consider poor Spain. Do not abandon my dear country, my unhappy country. And tears escaping from his eyes moistened his long beard, white with age. Sighs stifling his voice, the venerable old man placed his brow on General Lafayette's shoulder and stayed for some moments in this position, always murmuring, my son, my dear son, do something for my unfortunate fatherland. It was not without deep feeling that the general tore himself away from the pious patriot. The men of color, a corps of African-American freemen who had fought at the Battle of New Orleans were welcomed by Lafayette at the Cabildo. After speeches by their commanding officer, John Mercer, Mercier, and by Captain Louis Simon, who appears to have been a man of color, Lafayette replied, Gentlemen, I have often during the War of Independence seen African blood shed with honor in our ranks for the cause of the United States. I have learned with the liveliest interest how you answered to the appeal of General Jackson. What a glorious use you made of your arms for the defense of Louisiana. I cherish the sentiments of gratitude for your services and of admiration for your valor, except those also of my personal friendship and of the pleasure I shall always experience meeting you again. The general then kindly shook hands with all of them and thanked the governor for the opportunity he had been given to become acquainted with them. Next came the members of the Medical Society whose president, Dr. Fortin, addressed Lafayette, who then replied. Then came the marshals who had been appointed to supervise the ceremonies on Lafayette's arrival the previous Sunday and with speech, with another speech and a response. Lafayette left the Cabildo late afternoon to make some private visits, including one to a widow of a Revolutionary War veteran. The last important function at New Orleans was the reception and banquet given by the Freemasons of the city. The location of this event is not entirely clear, but it may have been held at John Davis's hotel, which shared the same street number as the Orleans Theater or in the ballroom attached to the theater. It was either the ballroom or the hotel. By Thursday, a spacious room in, quote, the magnificent edifice with which the enterprising spirit of Mr. Davis had adorned this city was chosen for the banquet and a large room hitherto devoted to profane amusements was converted uh, to a Masonic temple for the occasion. After the speeches, which included two by Brother Masons and one reply by their guests, the party adjourned from the temporary temple to the banquet room where a sumptuous meal had been prepared. Before dessert was served, Lafayette was escorted by a private door to the Orleans Theater by the governor, the mayor, and a bevy of masons. He literally stopped the show. As soon as he appeared, the whole edifice rang with loud exclamations. Lafayette soon left to applause through the same private door to return to the banquet for dessert. Later, the Committee of Arrangements arrange, uh, accompanied him back to the Cabildo. On Friday, April 15th, the Natchez was ready to transport Lafayette from New Orleans to Baton Rouge and then northward. The governor, Mr. Johnson, determined to accompany Lafayette to Baton Rouge. The recorder, Mr. Prior, decided to travel with the nation's guests as Lafayette was called to St. Louis. Livasor describes the day of Lafayette's departure this way. The 15th being set as the day of departure, the rooms of the general's apartment were filled early in the morning with an even larger crowd than that of the day before. He found there a, a large number of ladies and especially children whom their fathers brought there, they said, so that they could gaze on the features of the benefactor of the country, the friend of the great Washington. The general left on foot from his house and was surrounded by the entire population. Cries of Vive Lafayette greeted him as he passed. On crossing the parade grounds on which several companies of the Legion and the line troops lined the streets, he displayed his gratitude to all the officers whom he encountered there. He mounted the carriage at the end of the parade grounds to travel to the wharf where the steamship which was to conduct him to Baton Rouge was waiting for him. The levee was covered with an innumerable population. 
the balconies, the rooftops, all the boats and all the steamships that were found within range of the place of his embarkation were overloaded with people. And when he went on board, a prolonged cheer greeted him, but it was the sole cheer. And more than 10,000 people stayed absorbed in a profound silence until the Natchez was out of sight. A single cannon was heard at intervals and gave to this separation a kind of solemnity, the impression of which was profound and general. <clears throat> After Lafayette's Southern and Western tours and his return to Boston for the laying of the cornerstone of the Bunker Hill Monument, he made a second trip to New Hampshire, this time to the capital city of Concord. In order to accomplish his goal of visiting all 24 states, Lafayette headed east to Maine on June 23rd, 1825, returning to Concord on the morning of the 27th. He departed Concord at midday, heading west. After spending the night at Claremont, New Hampshire on the Vermont border, he departed on the 28th of June in a basket wagon belonging to Dr. Leonard Jarvis, traveling north tra along the Connecticut River to Cornish, New Hampshire, where the carriage crossed the river to Windsor and relinquished its precious cargo to the authorities of Vermont, the 24th state that Lafayette visited. The image in front of you is the basket wagon that Lafayette rode in. It's uh, owned by a museum on Long Island, uh, the, the Museum of Art, History and Carriages, actually, in Stony Brook, Long Island. After Vermont, Lafayette traveled back to New York City for the final time. As he left New York on July 14th, a militia unit that had renamed itself National Guard in honor of Lafayette and his service in the Parisian National Guard saw him off. By the end of the 19th, this is an image of that militia unit and Lafayette bidding them farewell. Uh, the arch in the background says ferry to Hoboken. He was heading to New Jersey, Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, th this uh, print is, is after a painting commissioned by the uh, United States National Guard in 1989, 200th anniversary of the French Revolution in honor of Lafayette. And the legend of this print uh, says that by, it describes this militia unit and they renaming themselves National Guard after uh, Lafayette's service in the Parisian La uh, National Guard. But then it goes on to say that by the end of the 19th century, every state militia in the United States had renamed itself National Guard. And it was all in honor of Lafayette. <clears throat> like Churchill in World War II, Lafayette lived in the White House in August and September of 1825 with President John Quincy Adams. On September 7th, President Adams sent Lafayette off aboard a new frigate named the Brandywine in his honor, in honor of his service in the Battle of Brandywine, where he had, was wounded, thus shedding his, his blood for the American cause. In his journal, Lafayette in America in 1824 and 1825, Levasseur chronicles Lafayette's visits with his old friends, John Adams, Jefferson Madison Monroe, and John Quincy Adams, and his new friend who he met during the farewell tour, Andrew Jackson. And through Levasseur's eyes, we get glimpses of the characters of these early American leaders. Jefferson is the ever gracious host Levasseur comments on the quote, the good appearance and cheerfulness of the Negroes of Monticello as attesting to the humanity of their master. But elsewhere, immediately afterwards, in fact, he describes slavery as a crime against humanity and advocates for the education of blacks and gradual emancipation, reflecting Lafayette's well-known abolitionist views. At Jackson's home in Tennessee, Lafayette has shown pistols that he had given Washington in 17. 78 and now belong to Jackson. When Lafayette recognizes them and comments, quote, that he felt true satisfaction in finding them in the hands of a man so worthy of such a legacy, Jackson blushes and his eye gleams as on a day of victory. My favorite story uh, in the book is the toll taker. Uh, 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 Lafayette wanted to pay a final visit to James Monroe while he was living in the White House while with, with Adams, President Adams, and Adams agreed. They got three carriages, they crossed the Potomac with, a, with their uh, entourage, and there's a toll taker, and Adams paid the toll. They're halfway across, and they hear the toll taker running after them. Mr. President, Mr. President, you're 11 cents short. 
So they stop and uh, Adams negotiates with the toll taker, agrees that he's 11 cents short, is about to pay it when the toll taker recognizes Lafayette and says, oh no, I'm not gonna take a toll to the nation's guest, but Adams insists, he insists, so he pays the toll. Levasseur says it is ironic that the one time in this 13 month visit that a toll was paid to Lafayette was, um, was in the presence of the head of state, a circumstance with it, which in every other country would have surely conferred immunity on him. While in America, Lafayette was the first foreigner to address a joint session with Congress and was addressed by the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, who called him a faithful and fearless champion of liberty. Congress voted Lafayette a national reward of $200,000, which was not chump change, about 3.5 million in current money, and 23 acres of land in Northern Florida. He was one of the earliest travelers on the Erie, Erie Canal in 1825 as he returned from the West to Boston. Lafayette died on May 20, 1834, and was buried in Pequot Cemetery in Paris in soil from Bunker Hill that had been shipped to him at his request. President Jackson gave Lafayette the same military honors as John Adams had reserved on Washington's death. America mourned. There were eulogies in churches and state legislatures and in private societies. On December 31st, 1834, John Quincy Adams, now a congressman, gave the official eulogy of the United States before a joint session of Congress. I will end this talk with an obituary, but not of Lafayette because we'd be here another hour, but of an obscure Philadelphian by the name of David Kramer. Mr. Kramer died in Philadelphia during the blizzard of 1888. He didn't die of the blizzard, but he died during the blizzard. The obituary is headlined, a man who knew Lafayette dead. David Kramer died on Monday evening the 12th after several months illness of a complication of diseases in the 73rd year of his age. So let's do the math, uh, 1888, 73 years old. His, he many years ago resided in Philadelphia where he was a contractor and erected many fancy dwellings for the leading men of the city. He was a member of the F and AM, the Freemasons, Carpenters Association and the IO of OF, the Odd Fellows, and at one time was an active member of the city council. In his youth, and here's, here's the punchline, he had the pleasure of seeing and conversing with General Lafayette during his last visit to America. Well, if you do the math, David Kramer, a successor builder and city councilor and joiner of all these organizations, was nine years old, when along with 55,000 other school children in Philadelphia, he met General Lafayette and got to shake his hand outside Independence Hall on October 4, 1824. And that was apparently the most important event of his life. So that gives you an idea of how significant this visit was to the American people. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alan, that was great. I mean, it's just unbelievable. He must have really enjoyed a lot of attention. Uh, he did, <laughs> he was a glutton for attention. But at the same time, he obviously uh, knew how big it was. We do have some time for a couple of questions. Um, if we do have questions, um, you can either put them in the chat. And it looks like most people are people that we recognize. And you could unmute yourself as well. I, I did want to bring up one quick question that I, you, maybe you can answer. The you know the uh, wording of Nash, uh, National Guard and Militia. Has that ever been challenged in court related to how it's always said that um, a Second Amendment argument is about based on that you always have a well-armed militia, but in reality, we have the National Guard, but it, it, I'm not debating that or one or the other. I'm just debating, well, if the story is true that they just changed the name from the militia to National Guard, you would think that somebody might have brought that up at some point in a legal argument. Yeah, well, I've never heard that that was, that was brought up, actually. 
Okay. But um, anyhow, it's uh, it's pretty remarkable though that they did that. I mean, it was the French Revolution. <laughs> and he created the National Guard in the French Revolution, the Parisian National Guard. Uh, but anyhow, but you know, the, the story is true. I mean, the, the National Guard, the history of the National Guard talks about that. And they, they uh, you know, commissioned the painting. Um, and then they, you, I, you're able to get these prints. They're in a warehouse in, they don't know what to do with them. They have thousands and thousands of them. They're in a warehouse in Maine somewhere. And I had a connection in uh, the Massachusetts National Guard. And every time I needed some, he'd get me 50 of them, you know, <laughs> packaged nicely with shrink wrap. <laughs> Well, if, if you do, if you did want to uh, get Alan's book, I have linked it in the chat and I will do it one more time. And it's uh, everyone can get uh, the friends membership. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, I want to thank Alan for taking the time tonight to uh, to do the lecture. And I want to thank all of you for attending tonight. Multiple excellence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alan. Very, very good. So everyone very much enjoyed it. So uh, I really appreciate it. And we hope to see everybody next Tuesday talking about the blues. So thank you so much, Alan. Have a great night. And thank you to everyone else. And we'll see you next Tuesday. All right. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you.